Okay, we're ready. So it's going to be the last lecture of the class. What we're going to do is we're going to start to talk about a little bit of cleanup of last part of the chapter. Then we will talk about the overview of the course. Okay, so we're going to review everything. Then eventually we will talk about, give you guys some suggestions on how to study for that. And uh, next uh, class, I will reserve that time. Uh, I'll come back, but uh, mostly I just un answer any question you guys have. Okay, so if you have a question, come, come back to the class. Otherwise, feel free to study by yourself. So, so everybody still remember what we talked about last class after a good holiday break? Some turkey and some wines, maybe? <laughs> Probably not too much, right? So let me remind you quite simply what we talked about last class. So we discussed uh, the rubber elasticity. We basically spend a lecture to talk about what's going on, say. Looks like it's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about rubber elasticity <laughs> and we talked about how to link entropy to the uh, modulus of your rubber. So we did some equation, we linked the thermodynamics to how you can link the modulus of your rubbery material to the cross-link density. This was one of the quiz today. Among the discussion, we found the simplicity and beauty of this technique is you can now, using a simple Gaussian chain statistics, using some simple second law of thermodynamics, to understand this beautiful equations, right? But there's quite some limitations in the assumption. So it makes this theory works at low degree of strain. So this is compression curve in terms of force, and this is displacement lambda. And there's two lines we put there. There's a dotted line. At compression, it's almost perfectly lined up with theoretical line, which is solid line. But in the tensile, you can see it started to deviate more. The more we pull it, actually your theory, what we have said is very simple and pretty, does not 100% agree what is reality is. So apparently, there is quite some limitation because the model we talked about is so, so simplified, it's missing some details. So using the next 20 minutes, we will talk about what we can do to make the model better. So in the textbook, um, this is uh, roughly 10.6. Uh, that uh, section talks about what people have done to improve this very simple model. And to make it even worse, if we look at the scale, this is extension ratio. What we in here, we only plot up to extension ratio of 2. If you keep plotting two lines, theoretical is solid. Dotted line is real. You can see for the real rubbery material, it has a quite a unique property is, you know, in the low strain, we already see the real data will be lower than theoretical one. And more interestingly is at high extension ratio. It start to deviate from what is original trend and start to increase quite rapidly. If you have a rubber band, you can sort of pull it and it will give you a direct feel. At the later stage, there is a very strong phenomenon related to strain hardening, or the more you pull it, it becomes more rigid, right? So clearly, we need to do something to make it better. And there are several theoretical development have done along these lines, so we will talk about um, conceptually, how people can address these, okay? Again, this is a, one of the equations we talked about. What is delta S, so, or entropy change during the deformation? This is coming from before and after stretch, right? You have the entropy before you stretch and after you stretch. Number of, an, um, this is number of cross links per unit volume. K is a constant. And this is a different duration. Uh, clearly, there is several problems. Mostly, it's due to one is um, Gaussian assumption for large extension is not valid. When you 
end-to-end -end distance, when you stretch a lot, your end distance, end-to-end -end distance will be getting closer to the contour lens. You can think about a coil. When you start to pull it more and more, pull it six times over the region lens, it will be relatively straight, right, for the polymer backbone. That causes a challenge. Secondly is, we don't talk about in this particular lecture, but another physical phenomenon is called strain-induced crystallization. What that happens is, when you pull the polymer chain, make them more aligned, this alignment of the chain will help the polymer chain to <coughs> crystallize. And once they start to crystallize, they sort of, sort of act as a physical crosslink, not a chemical crosslink, but physically. In the crystalline region, you have chain bonded together very tightly, and effectively, although you didn't directly increase cross-link density, but it's physically increased here when crystallization happens. It typically start happens here, and once this physical cross-link happens during the crystallization, it starts to go up very rapidly, about 200 percent, okay? And Strain this crystallization is very unique property for natural rubber, and that has been a key property for it to be used in Tyre and other places. There's many new polymers. Actually, one of the Southern Miss trying to develop is another polymer, elastomeric material, trying to replace um, um, trying to replace other material. And you know, one of the key property we want to see is if, if it's as good as the natural rubber. And in the rubber elasticity theory, it follows classical picture. It definitely shows similar phenomena, but the degree of strain decrystallization can be tuned. So you can move this left and right to make it onset early or later to change additional rubber property. But in the theory, we talk about ideal model, we don't consider any physical cross-linking due to the crystallization, okay? And melting point for these natural rubber is also quite interesting. It's right around the room temperature. So if you stretch it, it will lower the melting point and make them easier to crystallize, okay? Those are some of the obvious reasons. So there are several other non-obvious reasons that we're going to talk about in this class, just to cover every aspect of our rubber elasticity. It's a little bit text heavy. So we basically listed every single assumption we talked about in deriving the rubber elasticity. So first the two we have discussed, mostly in, two, in the last two lectures. One is there's no change in internal, e internal energy. So when you pull it, there's no difference. The second one is there's no volume change at a constant pressure and temperature. Those are the basis or fundamentals of the second law of thermodynamics. We use them to, to simplify how the forces relate to the entropy. OK, those two are generally OK. So we don't worry too much about these. There's additional four assumptions that need to be considered more carefully. First is chain confirmation for those strands, or basically the polymer chain between crosslink, follow the Gaussian distribution before and after deformation. Before, it's pretty straightforward. We know that's the case between the crosslink point. But after deformation, as we mentioned, at high degree of strain, it's not true. So we can address this by considering an additional factor. And we will just uh, spend one second to talk about that Okay, in the next slides. Second is chain confirmation before deformation need to be the same in uncross-linked states. That is generally true. If you think about a polymer chain in the male state, it's a Gaussian chain. But if it's if it's somehow people do funky things to do in the cross-link process, let's say you, you do the cross-link while you are sharing the sample. You know when you share the sample, you can create alignment in the polymer chain. 
and alignment can change the chain confirmation. So before you cross link, it's not going to be a caution. We need to consider several correction factors for this as well. Okay. There's two more. Junction point deforms affinity within the macroscopic deformation. We call it a fine deformation. So let's say your your rubber band I pull it twice, your polymer chain will be deformed twice as well. Well, there is some argument on this as well. We can make some detailed correction for this part. And lastly but not e least, number of elastically effective strain per unit volume is basically very simply given by this. Your density of gyro number by cross-link molecular weight. There is some problem for that as well. It works very well for low molecular weight cross-links as well as there's not much defects in the cross-link network. What if your cross-link happens in a chain that only form a loop of itself? Let's say you have a chain, you cross-link. It does not spin to cross-link point, but it's a cross-link with itself, intra-chain cross-link. So those type of cross-link doesn't contribute to elasticity, right? Or more severely is the entanglement effect. If your molecular weight is really high, as we know, or you guys may not have studied it yet, your polymer chain will entangle in the condensed phase. Condensed phase is typically, you can think about it as a um, melt phase. In the melt states, your viscosity depends on molecular weight differently after it's passing the critical entanglement molecular weight. It was almost linear, then it suddenly would take up turn. And that causes challenges to process high molecular weight because it's super viscous because of a lot of entanglement. And we need to make one additional correction factor if the molecular weight is high and consider the entanglement molecular weight. So we're now going to just to talk about what people have been done because rubber elasticity using the Gaussian theory was developed in the 50 and 60. So for the next 20, 30 years, there's a lot of interest for how can we refine the model to make it work better, especially all the, all the R&Ds in the industrial company like ExxonMobil as well as other chemical companies. They want to make better elastomer, not only chemically but also on a theoretical point of view. So there are several changes people made to modify those very oversimplified Gaussian theory, as we can see. The first part I want to talk about is how we address this one. So there's a chain confirmation difference before and after stretching, mostly in the after stretch. So we know the Gaussian di distribution, we studied in the first chapter, tells you what's end-to-end -end distance depends on the ratio, right? Depends on different end-to-end depends on how far you chain and distance is. So if this really large deformation, people start to adding a term called inverse logarithmic function. So what does this function help? The theory of rubber elasticity is to capture the non-Gaussian behavior of your polymer chain in the, in the later stage of deformation. So let's take a look what the, they did for this very simple theory. So this theory basically tells you p end-to-end -end distance di distribution function. Okay, the possibility of distribution will be proportional to exp minus of nx. H nxp <coughs> nx is number of um, number of the monomer unit of p. So you can see this is roughly the contour length. Beta is defined as H contour lens and XB, okay, and divide by L, oh sorry, L is contour lens, H is end to end distance. So by introducing this additional term, so this would be the typical Gaussian distribution, but now you added one more term as ln beta, sine beta. So this term 
if we plot this out, this would be the inverse long name function. The beauty of this function is now, when you deform the chain in a larger scale, h n to n distance, m b x is a contour lens. So when n to n distance approaches contour lens, that means you stretch polymer, polymer more and more close to almost fully extended states, it will capture that your force will start to increase rapidly. So this idea is quite straightforward, right? You just added a, a modification term mathematically that can help you capture what is going on for, um, for the later stage of increase in the stress. Basically, as you can see in this part, it's an empirical approach to make them agree. Why I say that? Because f this is not coming from solely deviation from Gaussian chain. As we said, the crystallization also happens in this stage, but it's not a content. However, empirically it works pretty well, so this particular relationship has been quite popular in describing the rubber elasticity at high degree of strain. Okay? So just to make sure, understand what's conceptually how people make modify the theory so that it can agree with more broader degree of um, deformation. So we talked about challenge number three. We have three more to go. So number four is there is an assumption that your polymer chain before and after deformation will take the same conform conformation. How can we address this one? So this says when you cross-link the polymer, it will, it will not, def it will not cause it to change different deformation. But really, it depends on how, what kind of physical state your polymer is at before deformation. It could be at equilibrium. Equilibrium we mean by lowest is any state you cross-link it. So that, that will be the Gaussian coil for the polymer chain. And after you crossing, it's, it will still be at that state. But there's another possibility that they were different. That means they were elongated while you, deform, uh, while you cross link it. Happens in the shear, in, the, in any other deformed state if they are not able to relax <coughs> back to the lowest state. So quite easy. We just need to consider the difference between the initial crosslink states. So the later term is basically the same. So we added a frontal front factor. This front factor is B specifically is this part. What do we do is we just tell, OK, we now need to consider what your polymer conforma conformation is exactly at before you crosslink it. H0 square is end to end distance at the Gaussian coil. So you can imagine your rubbery material is in the lowest end state. If it's slightly higher or different with H0, then you can describe with initial state of cross link. So that would be HI square average. That will be the value. Quite straightforward. That's how you address, you know, at the at the process of crosslink, your different chain conformation come into play. For example, if initial state your chain is elongated, if HI is twice of the final stage, you will see your entropy will be likely to be higher at the, at the initial stage of crosslink. That means in the later stage when you deform it, the delta S will be likely to be smaller, okay? There is two additional modification people has considered. Two more. <coughs> this one says the junction point de um, deforms a, a family with uh, macroscopic deformation. In other words, when we pull the rubber bands, 
it changes, agrees with macroscopic changes. But is that really the case? Not really. So here we need to talk about a, a new concept that we need to introduce first. It's very popular in the mouse state when you consider chain confirmation and chain dynamic change. It's something called a phantom network. Okay? What does the phantom mean? Hmm? Like ghost? Phantom of the opera? Somebody shows up at night but disappears in the daytime? So phantom means it's not real. It's something unrealistic, but this is uh, not a, a direct network, but you can imagine it is there. And this phantom means the network actually cross link point can move around the polymer chain. So it says the network is actually free to fluctuate around their main position. So what that means is if I'm cross linked along the, imagine you guys are the polymer backbone, I'm the cross link points. That means I have a little bit ability to move back and forth between cross-link points to describe my polymer chain. That's actually would be true if you think about reputation of the polymer chain in the melt. Think about that as a scenario. If everything is closely entangled, how does the polymer chain move or flow with relative to each other? It cannot you know, go past each other. Because physically, you have the polymer chain blocking it. The only way it can go is through a permeative pathway. Okay, So you think about each polymer chain can occupy a little bit of room around myself, then I can wrap it forward or backwards. Here, what it says is your cross-link point can be effectively considered to be fluctuating around the mean point. How does, the fit, how does it change the physical property? It changes in two effects. Okay? First, when I deform it, I no longer can consider it's a fine deformation, which is more real. A fine deformation says, if we pull twice the length of this polymer backbone, I will always align with well, and I will deform twice as well. Now, I can change. That comes into second effect. Your effective entanglement number of points will drop because of incorporation of this theory. This is more true because this Vx is the consideration. What happens if you if you have some fluctuation in the polymer backbone? If there is no affine deformation, then this will reduce a factor number of crosslink VE. As we did in a quiz today, we know that will result in a slightly lower modulus, right? Your modulus is directly proportional to what is V axis. Um, there is several examples how we can use this. So in different chain confirmation, we can consider different phantom points. Number of phantom points will affect different ways of chain reducing its effective cross make points. So in the vulcanizer rubber case, we can just uh, consider Vx. The reduction is likely to be half of Ve. OK? So that's, that's pretty important. It lo uh, looks like we almost consider every single aspect of deformation a polymer network, right? So there's one last assumption is we assume that your modulus is directly proportional to number of uh, molecular weight between the cross-link points. As I mentioned, this assumption does not consider any entanglement. So we actually need to consider, to revise that, consider the network defect and trapped entanglement between polymer chain. So what would you think the entanglement would affect modulus? So if your cross-link is the same, Density is the same for A and B polymer. A is not entangled. B is entangled between cross-link points. Any answer? Sony? Entanglement would increase modulus. 
it will behave like temporary cross-link points, right? Entanglement, basically, you can think about as a temporary cross physical cross-link point. It's not permanent, but it potentially is there and will change your modulus. So last of the changes people have been due for the rubbery elasticity series now consider what will be the <coughs> entanglement coming into play. This is happens to for highly flexible polymer chain as well as loosely cross-linked networks. What do I mean by loosely cross-linked? If you cross-link molecular weight, Mx is much lower, uh, much higher than Me. You can see how these two parameters come into play, right? Let's take a look at what, what would be changing your modulus of your material. G is total modulus. We can assume your original network would give you a modulus as well as your entanglement will come into additional modulus because of that. X is basically a parameter that is a constant between 0 and 1. It's a adjusting factor. Depends on different polymer, tells you how different cross-link density affects your, your final modulus property. OK? So if this polymer is very sensitive to cross-link density, x can be 1. You can see now your modulus just going to be rho rt, 1 divided by mx. This is what we learn for the Gaussian coil. Or it can be defined as rho rt, 1 divided by ne. This is additional term, right? So now it's interesting to compare these two. I want to use, uh, again, the example we talked about in the textbook. If x is equal to 0 0.5, if your me, let's say for, let's use a, a example. Let's use polystyrene. Although it may not be perfect fit in there, but me for the polystyrene is about 18k. Dalton, that means above 18k, polymer polystyrene will entangle a lot in the mouse states. This is equal to 0 0.5. Now you can see, if your mx is 18k on the similar level, then this would, would be increase your modulus by one third, right? This is x equal to 0 0.5. This is 18k. That means if your polymer is more loosely entangled, let's say your MX is 180, <coughs> with or without considered entanglement is huge. Without consider that and with consider that, it's a factor of five difference if you do the math. That means your entanglement increase a modulus by five times. However, if your cross link is very high, when this turn dominates and this turn doesn't matter, this happens at your highly cross-linked case. If your molecular weight be between the cross-links are within, let's say, 1K, which is highly cross-linked, the entanglement doesn't happen. You can also think about in the shorter chain, you are less likely to have any entanglement. OK? So those are the several series developed to describe better what people observed in the rubbery material. There is no, you know, definitely answer, but there's a lot of empirical equations help modify little by little, so a lot of incremental increases to help you understand a real network. There's one last slide I want to talk about is about uh, a theory called mooney roveling This turned out to be the most popular one. mooney roveling theory is basically they use a continuum mechanism to describe uh, an empirical equations about rubber elasticity. So you can do theory, or you can just uh, use empirical equation. Empirical means it works. People don't know why, but it's just to describe the data so well. There are several of those, uh, several of those kind of equations existing. For example, Fox equation describe how Tg between two components when they blend. What's the predict Tg? It's purely empirical. Okay. So let's take a look. This would be the last slides of this semester. So what this does is, this is the original equation we used to describe. Modulus depends on draw ratio. 
everybody familiar? This, although I changed a little bit, based on Mooney through equation. So C1 is now replacing what is um, K or the prefactor in the, in the uh, Gaussian rubber elasticity theory. So Mooney and Rivling basically says, if we introduce a second term called C2, C is a constant, this would be C1. C2 depends on one minus one divided by lambda power of three. It can describe the experimental data much better. Let me show you what do I mean by much better. Remember here, even in low extension ratio, there's some differences. So Mooney-Rivling equation, if you apply that, you can close the gap at, ver at that little at that little gap you see here. So empirically, it describes much better. So you can think about it's a modeling or fitting the data. And using this additional term, it does exactly that job and makes data fitting much easy. So that's new term people describe, OK? How do we actually apply this theory or use this equation? It's also relatively straightforward. So we can do some simple math to rearrange it. So what all you need to do is to group this term, lambda minus 1 divided by lambda squared. This and this term only differs by 1 divided by lambda, right? So if you combine these two square box, you can get this equation. So your stress will be equals to 2 multiply C1 plus 2 multiply by C2 divided by lambda and multiply lambda minus 1 divided by lambda squared. It looks complicated, but there are several parameters we can measure. So in the experiment, what you can do is measure the stress and measure the draw ratio. If I go to the lab, I put my polymer there, I stretch it to draw ratio 2, 3, 4, 5, and I can measure stress. So in other words, this stress is now. Although this looks funky, but this can know, right? You know lambda, and you can calculate out this term. So if we do a little bit rearrange, not too much, you use this term, stress, divide by everything here in this box, relate to the draw ratio. You can rearrange this to be stress divide 1 minus 1 lambda square would be equals to just 2 multiplied by C1 plus 2 uh, multiplied by C2 divided by lambda. Now you can plot. What do I mean by that is now you have a term. This you can regard as y-axis. Everything you can measure, right, if you measure data point. Like osmotic pressure homework we did. If you know the osmotic pressure concentration, you can plot it this out. And you know exactly 1 divided by lambda would be. You can plot like this. This would be the y, exactly as we did here. This would be 1 divided by lambda, and plot our data points. It's going to be a linear fit for the data points. There's two things we want to get out of this plot. One is where it intercepts when lambda, 1 divided by lambda, OK? This will tell you what would be 2 multiplied by C1 is. And slope of this curve will be 2 multiplied by C2. So why this is a useful plot? So only rolling plot will give you an empirical description of your stress strain behavior slightly better than what is ideal Gaussian curve, right? If you know what is C1 value, C2 value, you can put this back. Then you can predict out, predict out better in the stress strain range what your stress would be. Although it's empirical, but this guy is very successful. And it's very simple to use, like osmotic pressure. So this has been adopted quite widely about mooney roofling equation. OK? So this, until now, we pretty much summarized with the rubber elasticity theory. So those are some of the modification in the original theory. 
There's so much work, we cannot describe every single of them, but uh, I'm trying to capture some of the essence of it, explain to you guys what people has done to make it slightly better than what they are. Rubber elasticity field is now uh, not as big as used to be. There's still people developing more on the material side than theory because you can see there's quite some work that's already been done. And if you want to go to more details, there's a lot of parameter we need to consider, like dispersity, for example, in the crosslink networks. How do you create a more uniform dispersed? How do you create more uniform crosslink density or you know, crosslink point between different molecules? Like in the vocalization, it's very random. So you have a large distribution. So anybody interested? There's an MIT group, um, John John, uh, J. I forgot his name. John. I, I'm sorry, I cannot remember his name. I think John Jeremiah, as well as um, the other person, is um, they're working together on developing some of the better approach. But their approach is different. So they start the design using polymer chemistry to synthesize the polymer with precise networks where you can know exactly where the crosslink points. So using that, they can have better model to follow because the data they measured is more realistic compared to a lot of vulcanization process for the natural rubber is more random, right? Then theory can be slightly improved. Quite nice work. So with that, um, we're going to summarize. So we're going to take a break. Within the, within the five minutes, we come back. Then I'll go through the lecture of what we all talked about from chapter 7, 8, 10, give the overview, OK? Mm -hmm.
Right. So for the second half of the class, I said I better finish it today because I heard there's a test even on Thursday. So it's kind of brutal, you guys, if you need a test and another lecture on the same day. So why don't we do it today? So um, let me also raise this up. So this has helped you to walk through what we have learned throughout the whole lecture from chain confirmation to solution theory, then to the rubber elasticity, okay? So this will like a time travel for me. So in September, when we begin the class, we start to talk about chain confirmation. In the statistics. So this is the most fundamental part for all the quantum physics. Usually, when we start teaching the quantum physics, this is the first lesson we give all the students. So you can think about this as a 101. And what this does is tell you all about how does the chain behave in in an ideal case. This will give you an idea, most fundamentally, how the polymer chain in terms of size and dimension. Okay, so we started to talk about size and dimension. We learned about different models. So make sure you guys review what are all the models are. There's three key models we're going to talk about. And you'll, you need to learn how to differentiate one from each other. OK? So one of the key things about size and definition is we, know, we need to know how to describe a polymer chain. So this comes into size in terms of REE, end-to-end -end distance, radius of gyration. Those are all the critical parameters for us to describe how your polymer chain is big or small, right? We have smaller one to bigger ones. A more direct way is those as well as, as LC, which is contour lens, how big your polymer chain is in a larger scale. You know, knowing all these concepts are critical as a beginning part of this lecture, right? Then we moved on to talk about chain rigidity. This is, cannot be described by any of these parameters because you know, even if you have a rigid chain or soft chain, depends on the molecular weight, you, you can have all, all kinds of combination of end-to-end -end distance or size. So a more objective term is teach you guys about persistence lens, LP. How does this concept come into play? Why we can use persistence lens to describe how rigid your polymer chain, right? We had quite some discussion about persistence chain. <laughs> Lastly, we have talked about distribution. Or probability. of end-to-end -end distribution, end-to-end -end distance. This equation is a bit long, <coughs> but you need to know conceptually how to describe end-to-end -end distance in terms of probability function. And using that, we actually have a very nice homework. We know what's the probability of weight center, size center, and probability will tell you all about 
what's the chances of you getting the end to end distance? So this is all about first part. <coughs> As we know, the keywords about confirmation statistics, right? So in the second part of the lecture, we start to talk about and eponymous solutions. Face behavior, eponymous solution is the keywords for the second part. So follow my guidance. For the second part, we now start not only cares about something in ideal. This is also called ideal chain. So this need to be transit to something in real chain. Unfortunately, for the problem of chemistry class we teach, or physics class using the textbook, they never talked about in the middle of that. In the middle of this, you actually have a real chain. This is a discuss how does a polymer chain behave in solution. We only touch the base a little bit in both you know, the last section of each chapter. What does real chain mean is consider how does polymer chain behave in solution, in good solution, in bad solution, in theta solvent. So I sort of put it in the middle, okay? Because there's a transition between these two. In the face, in the face behavior, we actually need to know the review of thermodynamics. We need to learn these fundamentals so that we can actually link the entropy and enthalpy behavior. Using those information, we know the criteria for mixing of two components, let's call it. So we start discussing very simple something <coughs> called the regular lattice theory. So in this part, everybody recall what is the regular lattice theory? We draw chessboard. We play white and black chesses there. This tells you what is the entropy and enthalpy contribution. To mixing. So you you should know what are these coming from, right? Entropy, we actually did quite a lot of interesting case on how does entropy change to before and after mixing, and how we you can use entropy to get delta S change. Enthalpy change, we start to talk about how does polymer interacting with itself or with each other. This later leads to the chi parameter, okay? And we will talk more about that. After we talked about regular lattice theory, we start to move into polymer physics, Flory Hagen theory. For this, we, you need to know why the polymer are not likely to mix with each other. What's the difference between the lattice theory versus um, the second theory? Let me make sure I turn it on so that everybody can hear me. So this changes because now you have delta S change due to connectivity. Because the polymer chain is connected, we now have Flory Hagen series describe how does polymer chain behave differently versus solvent solvent, right? It has been an ongoing scene for these. 
after we talked about all those, we actually laid a pretty solid background. So based on this, we now started to talk about phase diagram. Which is a very applied side of the theory. Very nicely done. So you can use Flory Hagen theory to apply to your data and get what the phase diagram for your material. And I can draw a typical one. <coughs> LCST, and we learn about all these binodal behavior and spinodal behavior, right? And we need to know what's the definition of the difference, and we need to learn about critical points. What? How do we define the critical points, and how does critical points depends on, you know, molecular weight, for example. If you use Flory Hagen theory, how does molecular weight affect the critical point? And we also learned about this would be phi C critical temperature. How does the critical temperature being affected by all the parameters be coming from Flory Hagen theory? Okay, I won't speak about detail, but I want to give you some flow and concept, help you to guide you how to study. After we learned all this, we actually sort of take a little bit detour. We discussed about osmotic pressure. This is why I call it a little bit detour, because they don't fit in directly in all these. But because of thermodynamics, the length of these two, we took a little bit detour and start talk about osmotic pressure. And we understand how we can use this to measure two important parameters, molecular weight, as well as Second, the viral coefficient, how we can use those two. And this is a still widely used technique, so something you should learn about this. And this one, I'll wait Dr. Simone to teach you about light scattering and know how to get the RG, okay? It's a little bit detour, but actually, we would go back when we talk about Flory Hagen theory, okay? We relinked these two parameters. We described in the classroom how second the very coefficient and floating Hagen theory can be potentially links to describe the solvent property. Right? So they were both useful for Solvent quality, so quite important. And we talked about origin of chi parameter. Okay. In this, we introduce cohesive energy for the solvent, so you can use chi and cohesive solvent energy to describe it. And we only touched base of the importance of chi, but you will know throughout your PhD or your future work, chi is quite critical. So this chapter is definitely a pillar for this whole semester about chi, about phase diagram, about mixing. After that, we have a, I actually want to use here. So last chapter, we now go back to talk about Chain confirmation. Very much linked to chain confirmation, right? We start to discuss the different states of the polymer. You know, at the beginning we talked very broadly about viscoelastic property, etc. But also the purpose to talk about 
rubber elasticity theory so in this chapter what you what do you need to learn is how does rubber elasticity versus metal deformation entropy and enthalpy contribution in in both cases what their res respective contribution that has that h this would be one of the key then we actually go through quite it extensively to use chain statistics in the thermodynamics to understand rubber elasticity okay to predict So in this part, we need to learn how they are linked together. Not, not probably in much detail about equations, etc. but you need to learn the origin. And in future, when you need to come back, you can follow the textbooks and understand the flow. And understand how now, how does cross-link density G E modulus. And lastly but not least, we talked about some limitation and and further development of the theory. Okay. So those would be the last chapter we did. We sort of covered in terms of in terms of polymer physics, some very classical theory we all cover. Okay, in terms of chain conformation to Flory Hagen to rubber elasticity theory, those are all a milestone theory or relatively they are very successful in terms of describing unique property of polymer. So I don't expect you guys to memorize all the equations, etc. But there is one goal I want everybody to remember. So when you graduate with a PhD, when you're chatting with somebody, you can explain what is Flory Hagen theory. Tell them what Flory Hagen theory is about. Explain in a simple language. Don't need the equation, but you have to be able to describe it in a minute or two. And I expect that you should remember that as polymer. You study the polymer physics class. If they haven't studied this class, I'm pretty sure they don't know this. The other one is you need to able to describe the rubber elasticity series. This is something also quite fun when you describe this. This is very unique to the polymer. So as a polymer physicist, maybe I'll ask you in the final defense what is describing what is <laughs> rubber elasticity. Equations are important, but we are in the 21st century, so I don't expect you to memorize every single of them without any problem. So the final test will have equation sheet like you have. Okay, so I will provide that. And in terms of final test uh, format, it will be very similar to the previous two you had. We will have break down into four parts, multiple choice so far. Uh, conceptual understanding, understand what's the concepts. Uh, and I expect you understand most of concepts throughout the lecture. It will be evenly split between three chapters. We will have some 
three to four numerical questions, and those are related to some of the fundamental questions we have discussed, talked about, or worked on in the previous test. Okay, that will be similar, but don't expect uh, exactly the same. However, those would be helpful for you to review those key concepts. Last but not least, my favorite is some numerical derivation questions, but those will be bonus. We will have two of those. If you can get them, you will get some bonus points on top of 100% scale. Any question? If yeah, Levi? Take a look at our first two exams. Can we come to your office? Yeah, yeah, you can feel free to come there. Cool. Any more? If not, then I'll come back on Thursday. And then I'll be here answer any question during the process you guys reviewing. But uh, I know you guys have another priority is someone going to give a test Thursday. So I'm not sure. But I will be, again, I will be here. Uh, I will designate a Wednesday afternoon before you guys test. So next Wednesday afternoon, feel free to stop by my office if you have questions. That's more realistic. <laughs> OK. With that, uh, we're going to summarize today's lecture. In this semester lecture, hope you learn something about quantum physics. And, and next uh, semester, I, I like to talk one more thing. Next semester, to give you a little bit bigger picture, we learned all the, all the chain confirmation solution property. But what is missing? What is missing is mostly two parts. And they will be taught by two professors. One is uh, Dr. Yong Simon. He will teach you guys about scattering <coughs> technique. We kind of eluded they are very important throughout the lecture, especially in chapter 6. They're the most important technique to measure the dimension of polymer in solution. So measuring RG, he will start talking about TG. Then there's two more properties he's going to talk about is dynamics, viscoelastic property, as well as um, melt property. So you will learn all these Rouse model, Zim model about polymer, how they move in solution state. So quite important, right? And apart from that, Dr. Nass is going to talk about something very interesting as well. So broadly speaking, I would say that's into the morphology part. We talked about solution. We talked about uh, chain confirmation, ideal chain. But most common use is actually in solid states. You don't have solvents. Polymer is dry, like this. So in this case. You need to talk about glass transition temperature or glass transition phenomena. How, what theory is there can help you understand why some of the polymer are very soft, some are rigid. And crystallization, another interesting polymer physics problem has been probably there 100 years, but still many problems are unsolved. OK? All right, so let's wrap up today's class. And the homeworks, please uh, put it here. Mm-mm. <clears throat>